Let's begin. So good afternoon, and this is our lecture explaining exactly step by step how you can create your aesthetic experience um, and the description thereof. So the text is you can think of as the process of understanding your experience. This relies on the uh, uh, aesthetic therapy uh, principle of poesis, the ability to create something in words based on an experience that was emotionally moving or important um, or significant to you. So um, part one is to uh, create a description, okay? And the description you see um, mostly should be the stuff in yellow if you follow the logic of the Virginia Woolf text about which I will speak a little bit later. But the point is, if you say, as Woolf does, uh, uh, the moth had um, hay color wings with little fringes. This is just pure description. It's like saying, I am holding a pen, it is purple, and it says paper mate on it, you know, pure description, you are not adding emotional um, attachment to the object yet. So my pen is purple, as opposed to this is my favorite purple pen, that would not be pure description. Right. So pure description, just trying to uh, describe the attributes of the object. The significance is already the author's emotional response, uh, which is based on the significance of the object to the author. So here's an example. And this was written by someone who clearly really loves dogs. So that's very um, evident from the beginning. The large plastic cone, which engulfed the head of my dog, collided with almost everything in the 12 inch radius. Bucks, which is the name of the dog, paced around the waiting area accompanied by a couple of other animals. He was a spry, sleek, black Labrador retriever with a shiny cold nose and deep brown eyes. His fur was so shiny that at times, see this is not pure description anymore, which I pointed out to the student, it seemed he was groomed with oil. So that's an attachment of already significance or, or, you know, a kind of not just pure description. The stocky frame of my black lab, again, seemed to occupy less space when he saw the vet's door swinging, swing open. So notice the difference between yellow, pure description, and the baby blue, the connotation. In this part, the author is trying to demonstrate that the dog gets scared when the vet's door is opening, right? And this again is reflection. I could tell it should be in baby blue as well. I could tell my dog was filled with anxiety. Some say that dogs do not have much capacity for long-term memory, but I beg to differ. Each time we approach the building of the veterinarian office, my pup tenses up and walks reluctantly. So the pure description here is only this part. So I encourage you to describe your object as I did with this student to describe it a little bit more. Try to write 150 to 250 words in order to describe the object. Here's another example from another student's work. This is the pure description. My piano was an electric piano, a keyboard to be exact. Electric keyboards typically have 66 keys, as did mine. The keyboard was a Casio keyboard. The keyboard has two speakers, 66 black white keys and a variety of different settings, it should say, to produce a wide range of sounds. The childhood keyboard of mine had a black exterior with a black stand. Okay, so this is pure description. I'm sure you've seen a piano like this, right? What makes this an aesthetic encounter or a kind of creative exploration of the object, which you think is worthy of sharing with the world, is all the stuff that's not yellow. So context, for example, maybe you don't actually know anything about the piano as an instrument, dear reader. So the author is telling us, pianos are usually tools which are used to provide entertainment in the form of music. Maybe not the best sentence in the world, but at least it's an attempt to give context, right? 
um, maybe we can talk about how to rewrite this sentence. Pianos are musical instruments which for centuries have provided entertainment. I don't know. You don't have to be so fancy. But the point is, context is important when you write because you want to give your audience an understanding of what and where in the world you are writing. So the next sentence, there are many brands of pianos, each offering slight variances in their construction. Some piano brands include uh, Kawaii, Casio, Yamaha, and many more. There are a few main types of pianos, grand, upright, and electronic. So you see how this is context, right? This is not a description of the exact piano. That's what's in yellow. And this has no emotional attachment to it. Pianos come in different shapes and sizes. My piano looks like this. So what, right? Like we don't have a sense yet why should I, as a person, care to read about this? Okay, so now you, you have a little bit more of uh, importance um, developed. The most important thing about this instrument was the sounds that it produced. The sounds were beautiful. Having experienced other pianos later in life, see this is pure reflection. The author down the line in the future experienced uh, uh, other pianos and now uh, in the present moment looking back at the past argues that this particular piano has proven to be superior the sound was very precise each key emitted a very loud and distinctive sound i would argue that this is not even so much reflection as pure description but again there we can debate that right the point is it's quite clear when you are creating emotional connotation. And this is what part two is asking you to do. So here's another sentence of significance. The name I gave my keyboard was Violet, this being a name of a childhood crush. Now we're getting into interesting territory of why is this piano so important? And maybe we can even ask, are you sure this piano was as special as you say? Was it really the most perfectly sounding piano in the world? Maybe not, but it is to the author because of their connection to the, to the history with this instrument, right? So I don't know if you have an instrument that you've given a name to. Um, I had one student recently uh, who uh, said that uh, his laptop uh, is named Potter because he thinks it's a magical device. So it's named after Harry Potter. I must admit, I really don't care for smartphones. Mine does not have a name. I wonder, does your smartphone have a name? Um, do you have other inanimate objects that have names? This is an interesting thing to think about, especially if we connect the idea to Winnicott's concept of transitional objects and that humans, when we're children, we actually believe that our teddy is partially alive. Uh, even if we suspect that other people don't believe it, we still believe it. And that's the point. We need our imagination to expand um, to realms that are beyond reality in order to have a healthy psyche, so to speak. Healthy meaning it has tools to deal with difficulties in the world. And that's one thing that um, on the midterm, I think a lot of you try to approximate, but maybe not completely understood. The fact that an object, something like a pen that was given to you by your grandfather when you were a child, it became a kind of transitional object. Why? Well, in part because it gave you a skill or an outlet in order to express your emotions. That pen allowed you to write things. And by writing about your emotions in your journal, you were given a chance to become a more thoughtful uh, human psyche, you know? So this is the point of the assignment. When you're describing the object that you choose to describe, you have to start thinking about it more than just a material thing, right? It's not just a plastic pen. It's not just purple. There's something else about it that you want to talk about. To come back to the text. So you see this piano, it, it is special because it reminds the writer of their first childhood crush, somebody they fell in love with, and her name was Violet. The keyboard was gifted to me by my parents as a birthday present. Interestingly, 
what birthday, what how old the, the person was is not mentioned. Interesting thing to exclude, you know. Um, the keyboard did not come with a pedal. Anyone who plays the piano understands that pedals are essential. And then again, pure description. The three pedals are this, uh, the sustain pedal, the soft pedal, and the sustentio pedal. The sustain pedal, as the name implies, is reasonable for sustaining notes when it is pressed. The pedal adds melody, flow, and rhythm to songs when it is used. Since my keyboard did not originally come with this pedal, I purchased an individual one. This was the final piece of the puzzle and was transformative to my sound. This keyboard was a timeless piece of my childhood as it began a musical journey for me, which has continued until now. So, I mean, essentially in the final sentence, you get the uh, writer's reason for writing about this piano. Music is part of what helps them relate to the world. Music is how this author expresses their emotions even more deeply than through writing. But one, you know, not criticism, but uh, a couple of questions that I would pose to this text, you know, one would be, how does the piano allow you to express emotions, emotions that are not as easily expressed in words. This is a question that I think this particular piece makes us want to answer. And I won't talk about the final project yet, but this is where we get into notions of art therapy that are not language based, like painting, like music, like dance, self-expression that does not rely primarily on written or spoken words. So I hope you see that with this piece, you know, initially the description was just, my piano is like this, the sound is like this, and it, you know, the pedals are important and that's it. The other colors help to express the significance or the um, emotional attachment to the object. So just to finish off that thought, let me read, uh, if we think back to the dog um, uh, aesthetic uh, experience, here's one more example um, of taking that uh, idea of the uh, dog the description of a dog and adding significance to it. And this is for the dog lovers out there. So the day of Bucks's checkup appointment, that day at the veterinarian office, I reflected upon the anxiety that humans felt when they saw another couple's pet near death. My pup was young. He had just been neutered, but he had his whole life ahead of him. How do we deal with the mortality of our pets when they approach the latter days of their lives? Do we sigh more often and hold our furry friends closer? Some of us perhaps find solace in rescuing animals from shelters. When my family lost our first dog, Bucks, the, to spleen cancer, he was 10 years old and I was away on my trip with my boyfriend. My mother had to hold Bucks in her arms when he was put down. Upon my return, I wept for hours and what seemed like days and months. Yet my boyfriend, soon fiance and husband soon after, promised we'd look for a puppy when we find a place of our own. My mother, on the other hand, has never wanted another dog since Bucks. The sunny day we discovered the family farm where our first furry baby was born reminds me of the joyful days of traveling with my husband on adventures that led to growth. I felt so alive when we met the eight Corgi puppies, one of whom would become our dear Booker, the Corgi. He has been with us since then. When I look at Booker, I am reminded of Bucks and the kind of first dog that he was, a companion, a friend, a protector. He once chased one of my mean-spirited classmates in a high school up the tree. That Sergey was up to no good and Bucks knew it. I keep a photo of Bucks on my desk along with a paw print of Booker that I made when my first child was born. These are mementos that keep reminding me of all the good we share when we have companions and furry children in our human lives. So 
Um, before I stop the recording of this piece, uh, for those of you who can't uh, be here to chat live today, which is fine because these are optional meetings, what I'm asking you to do is to write the pure description and the significance or context pieces separately. So you take your object and you write a pure description. Again, as I mentioned, this could be anywhere from 150 to 200 words, no more, very short. And then you write a significance piece of roughly the same kind of length, 150 to 200 words. And what you do is then you look at it and you try to analyze how does my description fit with the significance or how can I make the sentences intertwine in a way that allows for the reader to both encounter the object as I see it and to understand its significance as it is important to me. Because, for example, people who know nothing about pianos or music might not learn very much unless you try to give some context and explain why a piano is so important, right? Or people who really don't like dogs or maybe they're afraid of dogs. One thing that this piece is lacking, I think, is comparison to other pet owners, right? For example, maybe you're really a cat person, you know, and so maybe a little bit of thoughtfulness about how other people relate to animals can help to make that piece stronger. The entire project is out of 10, including, um, uh, you know, my analysis of your grammar, as always, attentiveness to clear writing. But the image that I'm asking you to include for this um, uh, assignment, the aesthetic encounter assignment is entirely optional. The image is something that can help you to, you know, present the object to me to say, here's a picture of my piano or here's a picture of my dog. Um, but if you don't have a picture of something you're describing, I am not asking you to spend time to uh, create a visual. You don't have to make an illustration if you don't want to. If you have the time and you want to do that as part of your assignment, great. Okay. So um, on that note, this assignment is also a kind of transition point to our final research assignment. So I'm asking you to choose your object of description in a way that helps you to say, this is something that is important to my expression of the self. So in particular, in the recorded lectures that I gave to you, you saw my description of the pen and you can tell I really care about writing. I think that writing is a really important way of uh, expressing the state of mind and emotion. Um, so the pen is really significant to me. And then the yogic studies that are um, the emotional attachment to that uh, pen is also something that I'm uh, very, very connected to uh, both personally and professionally. So in other words, I would motivate you to choose an object that is not just some random object. You know, I've had students describe their laptops and their phones but something that I think connects to what um, uh, Julia Cameron would call the, you know, the kind of inspiration, the artist's way, the path towards becoming a little bit more self uh, uh, loving, kind to the self, you know, so explore an object that will make you feel happy to write about would be my advice um, for how to choose your object. And as I said, this Sunday by midnight is your kind of suggested deadline. If you need an extra couple of days or even a whole week to finish it, I'm okay with that. I'm going on record to say, I am very sorry I'm behind on the marking and I hope that you will exercise patience and I will do the same for you. So if you need extra time on this assignment, please take it. Next week, we're talking about the uh, final research assignment, which you will be starting after finishing this assignment. And that final research assignment, I hope, will be the pinnacle of your experience in this course, where you get to really look closely at something that inspires you to be artistic, to be creative, or to do something good for yourself. For example, to cook a meal and to theorize about how cooking helps you to be a happier, healthier, 
subject, person, human being. Okay, so I'll stop there. And I look forward to reading your aesthetic experiences. All right, the recording's done. Uh, so, uh, sorry to interrupt, Professor, but no, like this is it. the uh, aesthetic object assignment and it like it is due on 14th of March, Sunday night at 12, right? And that one, uh, what about that walls, walls like a thousand word? Is that same thing or it's different? Like I'm still confused. There is no a thousand words uh, aesthetic experience assignment. I think you're thinking about the research assignment. I mean, I, if, if you guys want, I'll show you what the research assignment is live. Uh, no, just one second. So like this Sunday at 14th of March, we have just this aesthetic object assignment due, right? Mm -hmm. Which consists of pure description, its significance and then combination. That's all? Yeah. Yes. And uh, like, uh, do we need to write in like that first? Colored format or like simple plane is fine. Okay, so previously I've uh, insisted that the students use the color encoding system that is in the Virginia Wolf piece in order to kind of encourage you to think what each sentence is doing. But I think that that could cause a little bit more anxiety because some sentences do more than one thing. A sentence is capable of both describing and adding connotation, you know, you know what I mean? So no, you are not required to use the color coding system, but if it feels like it helps you to organize your aesthetic experience, then you're welcome to use it. I will not uh, assign marks to the color coding. If you find it helpful, you can use it. If you don't find it helpful or you find it stressful, just Okay, thank you so much, Professor. You're very thank welcome. You. Andrea, you have a question. Hi. Hello. Okay, so my question is, uh, you know, like that you provided us a Word document, right, that has Wolf's text, and then in the bottom, it's the same thing that you showed us now. So uh -huh. we're basically going to write our piece there in some minute, right? Oh, sorry. So you're asking about where to submit it? Am I correct? Uh, yeah, because like, you know, the word document you gave us, you had wolf sex and down, you had like the peer description and significance and the marks and how they're presented. And then there's like a couple lines where we can fill like uh, our text and write. Um, that's just, uh, to be honest, that's a relic of a printed uh, copy of the assignment when we were in class. So students oh. would start writing it in class. You don't have to use that template. You can use an empty Word document and the link as always will be posted under assignments. Um, after today's uh, uh, live session, I'll post the submission link so you can um, upload your document uh, in Word. Um, or other text-based uh, document. Can I ask you guys please not to use PDF actually because I don't have a PDF um, software with editing on my computer right now. Okay, that sounds good. And I have just one more question. Uh, so for the significance and like the peer description, it's okay if it's intertwined, right? Like if I start off with like a peer description and like there's kind of some significance in it, but I, I, I'm gonna try to make it like uh, not connected but is it okay if it's a, like a bit connected? Absolutely. So try to keep them as separate as you can. Part of the exercise is to see how, you know, emotion leaks into our descriptions without even us wanting to. So when I ask you to write a pure description of the object, it's kind of like forcing you to just look at the object and say, well, what is it, right? And then you start thinking about, well, why is it so important to me? Why is it significant? Why do I care so much about this? pen or this piano or this dog, right? And so if some of it starts to already bleed one into the other before you combine them, right? Uh, I'm okay with that, but you know, maybe, you know, sort of try to say, okay, I'm trying to write pure description. I'm trying to write significance, context, and then see how changing the order of these ideas could impact the overall effect of the text. And I think that that's exactly what um, Virginia Woolf's um, text demonstrates really nicely, that she alternates the different types of sentences in a way that allows us to see um, how re the revealing of significance um, can take some time. At first, it's just 
look at the moth. The moth is flying in the window. Why do I care about a moth? It's just a little bug, right? But then she gets to the point where you start to feel like the moth is actually a creature worthy of our sympathy, a creature that the author tries to help by nudging it with a pencil. And then the, the moth dies and the, the text asks you to think about your own mortality, but also about how lucky we are to have such a long, beautiful life compared to the life of a moth, right? Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So okay. like uh, one more thing for mm -hmm. when we're describing something, we're going to talk all about personal stuff like I see in this way in the significance and so on. But can we like relate it to another person? Like we can say, like, for example, I think that this method would be um, like whatever the object is, it would be useful for another person if they use it in this way. So like you, you can make it more uh, common among people. Yes. And I think that part of part of what makes us human in general is that we want to relate our own perception of the objects around us in a way that others will appreciate so you're getting exactly at the you know the the underpinning uh theme that we explored before the midterm the idea you know Lacan's mirror stage essentially suggests that we actually care what others think more than what you know I feel as an individual is important. In other words, to give you a simple example, when I see children or, or let's, let's focus on, on, my, on my own little ones. So, you know, when I see them desiring to have their friends approve the way their toys uh, are or like what kind of toys they have, or when my daughter says, I don't want to wear these jeans, I want to wear a dress, you know, she is indicating to me that, you know, she is painfully aware that the kind of society that she's thrown into expects certain things from her as a girl. She's even asked me, mommy, why do you have short hair? You're a girl, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. So gender norms or you know, perceptions of what is cool or not cool, you know, my son uh, talking about certain, you know, toys that are important to him. And I ask him, well, why are they so important? You know, you already have toys. Why do you have to get that one? Oh, because my friends think it's the coolest thing in the world, you know, and you can relate to this, I'm sure. Think of an example of something you really want that, you know, has been hugely ad advertised by some industry or another right that it wasn't your desire it was the desire of the other as Lacan says and so we mirror those behaviors and therefore when we describe anything we describe a pen we describe a piano we're already thinking will this be significant to other people will it matter to other people and the answer usually is yes um, but we want, we have anxiety about it. We want to say, I want to make this really important to others. And I really want, um, others to feel the way I feel. So Andrea, for sure, when you're describing your, uh, aesthetic experience, one of the things that, you know, as a writer, you want is for other people to say, yeah, that was interesting. Or yes, that's important. Or I can feel emotionally what you felt, you know, and this is the community of, of uh, affect, of emotion, of, of the ability to share our experiences in a way that makes meaning and creates healing, especially for um, experiences that are not so pleasant. You know, for example, dealing with the pandemic, many of you have expressed in your reflections, you know, the sense of isolation, the uh, lack of love and belongingness that you're feeling and how through some activities, you know, for example, having some family time, playing board games, you know, stuff like that, that at least it helps you to reconnect to that sense of community. And that I would say in all theories of psychology, sociology, and art therapy, a key theme is being part of community. That's what makes us human, right? This is what um, differentiates us uh, from 
at least some of the mammals on this planet, even though most mammals also have communities, you know, and, you know, I, I don't like the perspective that, you know, humans are the most social creatures on the planet, not some humans that I know, <laughs> you know, but there are certain species that don't require um, as much community as humans do. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, Mexican um, sort of raccoon looking kind of animal. I think they're type of raccoon and they're called Kayamundi. Apparently when they mature, basically after having reproduced, the males just go away and live on their own, you know, um, that, you know, you can look at the animal kingdom and see that there are some um, mammals like dolphins, for example, elephants, um, even tigers who have a lot more need for community. And there are others that do not. This is a big topic in animal philosophy. What makes us same or different as creatures on this planet. So when you try to communicate the significance, the importance of your aesthetic experience, yeah, of course, you're thinking about what would other people respond with, what kind of emotions would they have in response to my object and take that into consideration and in some way signal that or reflect that in your uh, emotional connotations, responses to the object. Sorry, that was a very long answer to a very short question. Does it help? That was great, thank you so much. You're very welcome, thank you. There's another question. No, so uh, I've been, if you need an extension that's only two, three, let's say even four days, please just go ahead and take it, okay? Because I am just absolutely, inundated with emails and it's not just you guys right it's not just my two cultural studies groups um, I also have a lot of administrative emails that come in and I TA for York University and I have to say that the amount of email in online learning is overwhelming because it used to be you see each other face to face and so many questions get answered um, in the classroom so this is obviously uh a big disadvantage of online learning. On the other hand, you have so many lectures that are recorded, which was never the case. I never recorded my lectures in class, you know what I mean? So you can go back and look and think about the topics that we cover again and again, especially before you know completing your major assignments, like the final research assignment. So that's an advantage. You have a recorded library of lessons, which you can always access again and again. So there are advantages and disadvantages to online learning. Um, uh, yeah, that's okay, Mansi. Really, eh? So other props like PDFs. Um, I just, because I'm on a Macintosh, my um, uh, trial version of the PDF editor ran out. I looked into getting it at Seneca and so far I've been unable to get the software free. It costs $20 a month. Um, so I've been resenting buying software um, because I feel like as a um, college professor, I should probably have it for free, but I haven't heard um, from the IT people whether this is possible right now or not. If I find out that it's not possible, I'll just buy the license, obviously. Um, but in the meantime, if you send me the PDF, what I'll have to do is uh, print it off, mark it by hand, and then send you pictures. So in, or, in order to avoid a little bit of that hassle, I would much prefer Word documents, but if PDF is the only thing that is possible for you, I will accept it. Um, yeah, so Mansi, I tried to get the Adobe Creative uh, Suite um, for free and through my login as a prof, it just, it says, um, unavailable or like the link is broken basically. So I've been trying to troubleshoot it. Can, um, and Andrea, I will post the recording as soon as we're done today. I will upload it immediately. Um, so, uh, uh, Mansi, do you, do you have, um, a possibility if you have the time to look, uh, where as a student you downloaded the, uh, Adobe package and if you can email me the link, um, yeah, no, I know. I logged in with my Seneca credentials and I was um, unsuccessful in downloading it. Um, I, in fact, I didn't get to the point of downloading it because uh, the link says 
you know, this is not available to you. Uh, and uh, I think it's an issue of an old um, uh, link, maybe, but I haven't heard from IT uh, people. Um, I reached out and I haven't heard. I'm, I'm sorry. Again, I'm trying to double, uh, triple check and troubleshoot, but um, yeah. Yeah, if, if you guys, if any of you knows exactly what the link is, because I went under my resources um, in online teaching and through there, through the apps, I could not download it. So I actually was considering just signing up for the $20 a month and forget about it. But um, if I can figure it out for free, it would be nice because I'm also a student and resources are limited, to say the least. Um, so... Um, can I show you one more thing? Um, and this is something that um, I think will help you to sort of see that the finish line is close um, and that we're only working on one more major assignment for this class. Um, and I'm really, really quite excited to um, uh, have you work on the final research project um, in the sense that it'll be something that I think helps you to wrap all the ideas together and to bring some closure to what you studied in this course with me. Um, and so, um, sorry, here it is. So this is what, and I'm gonna record this as well, just to, again, anticipating that some students are anxious about um, what's happening next week. I want this to be available so you can already have uh, a recorded um, piece of explanation of what will be expected on your first little tiny little part uh, called the research assignment proposal for uh, our final research assignment. So I'm going to record this as well, if you don't mind, and then I'll answer your final questions before we leave. Okay, so. Uh, Oh, I am recording. I thought I paused the recording. Beautiful. Let me just double check that again. Yeah, okay, I am recording. Beautiful. So the um, final research assignment um, it, and the components are such that first you're asked to come up with an idea. Second, to do a little bit of research and give me a couple of sources with annotations. And then finally, to create your project. And when I say you create your project, you can write an essay. If you want, you can just write an essay and make it very academic, and that's fine. Or you can um, research, as one of my students did, uh, a painter that really speaks to you and uh, explain what is significant about the work of this painter and how it connects to your sense of self, your sense of heritage or culture. So, uh, for example, um, a student um, uh, from a previous semester in this course uh, researched a painter's work, whose work he was already familiar with from the Congolese culture and the author's or the painter's name is Sherry Samba. This painting you see on the screen is called Jaime Le Crolet. And the um, imagery is both vibrant and colorful, but also quite disturbing, right? You see the peeling effect of this human, um, the representation of the human body. You see both inside and outside. There's a paintbrush with, um, colors dripping uh, almost like drops of blood. The student took the time to research what influenced this particular painting and what Samba does as an artist and pretty much wrote it as an essay, but provided also some images to demonstrate what this particular artist achieves in commenting on uh, racialization and racial injustice and uh, addressing racism through these paintings. What the assignment really asks you to consider is one mode of well-being. So for example, in painting, you can say artists get to express emotions that are otherwise difficult to verbalize, right? You can see in this painting, um, not only uh, 
perhaps a deconstruction of the idea of the inside and outside of a human existence, you know, black skin, white masks would be a France Fanon way of thinking about it. Um, or, you know, that's a psychoanalyst who wrote a very influential book that talked about the need to perform white norms, uh, to wear a white mask as a black uh, person in a white dominant uh, culture. So this was one of these groundbreaking works that addressed white supremacy and how to think beyond it and how to stop wearing a white mask. Um, so painters can do this, you know, using the language of uh, visual uh, representation. So one of the questions that was asked about the 1000 word uh, assignment, this is it, this is your final assignment. And you're asked to write either an essay, 1000 words, two sources minimum for your research, or you can research and prepare a cultural dish or a whole meal if you want, that demonstrates the difference between nutritionism and a more holistic approach to food. So the kinds of ways we've been thinking with Lisa Heldke and with uh, discussing food as not just mechanical fuel for the body, but uh, a cultural emotional manifestation of, of uh, sustenance of life, right? So if you choose to cook, for example, you also have to research at least two different articles or sources that talk about the food or the culture that you are exploring. Um, and you also have to include pictures of the dish or the meal that you prepare. So half the work will be preparing a meal. And then instead of a thousand word essay, you would write a 500 word analysis of the process of what you learned. And I think I already showed you before the break one of my students examples from last um, semester of the uh, bitter leaf soup that she prepared and analyzed as part of Nigerian culture. Um, so what I'm asking you to do starting next week is to think what kind of project would I like, would I like to work on for my final assignment. I forgot to say that uh, the third option is to uh, use your experience of an art form, let's say music, let's say you play piano or guitar or whatever other instrument and research how it could be used as therapy. Um, so if it's music, focus on, for example, what kinds of melodies that you may play would be beneficial towards lifting up spirits or allowing someone to feel more relaxed. Maybe how playing music connects with breath. Maybe how music connects with movement. Um, there are all kinds of, for example, styles of yoga that use music. My, my style of yoga does not use music. It says that the breath is your music, basically. So again, your project could be as niche and specific to your interests as you want. You can explain clay work. You can craft something out of clay. You can paint. You can uh, knit or crochet. Um, you can uh, create an art installation of any sort and explain its significance and what it means to you and to other people in the world or in the community that it is relevant to. Um, and so the, the third option, you know, you could very much see as a larger um, exploration of what I asked you to do in part one of your midterm, where I asked you what kind of issue or deficiency are you facing in your life and what kind of activities can you engage in to make yourself feel better happier healthier or maybe be more positive towards the things that you have to do in life for example i know uh, a couple of people in my life really struggling with uh mental health and you know uh, uh people who have uh, either been recommended or, or even forced to take medication and if if this is something that you for example don't really believe is the best route towards healing what kinds of activities do you think you would recommend to that person um, in order to give them something to do that helps in 
whatever way they need that help. Um, to give you a specific example, um, there are autistic children who are uh, pretty much nonverbal or completely nonverbal. They have no language. This interests me very much, actually. And so I, I know uh, they're not friends, but they're acquaintances. Um, they took their child to uh, a therapist who allowed the child to learn how to speak using objects, you know? So for example, you know, the child would have uh, a couple of blocks and a couple of other objects, you know, different shapes, different sizes, different colors. And each object the teacher would teach the, the child represents an idea. For example, this purple pen, it means Senya, it means I, you know? And this cup, it means I want a hug, you know? It, it means I, I, want, I want some, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be physical contact, but, but especially in the COVID world, but, um, but some kind of, you know, communication, right? And so if I would say, if I would position in front of my teacher this, and then this, the teacher would, would know that I want their attention. This is just a very, very simplified, I'm sorry for the generalizations, but a simplified way of creating an object relations kind of therapy. If you're not interested in that, I'm, I am, don't, don't research it. But what I'm asking you to do is to say, for the final project, considering everything I reflected upon in the course, based on my basic physiological needs, my needs for safety and love and belonging sort of in the Maslow hierarchy, my spiritual needs or my needs towards um, enlightenment in more of a yogic sense. What do I think I want to focus on in my final assignment that would give me something really enjoyable and productive and you know, useful to take away from this course? So a number of you, for example, complained of problems with sleep. I agree with you. Some of you saw me emailing at three in the morning this morning, you know. Um, I also struggle with insomnia. Um, how do you deal with that? I talked about it a little bit before. Guided meditations is one of my tricks for dealing with insomnia. Um, maybe you want to explore your relationship to food. Maybe you feel like the pandemic has really restricted your ability to eat in a way that's social. What do you do about that? Can you maybe using option C, create an experience that would help other people to eat in a more connected, mindful way? I'll give you a final example. I recently learned that one of my yoga uh, students um, who is pretty much old enough to be my mother. Um, she has a son who's just about 23, 24 years old. And he started um, teaching cooking lessons, teaching people how to cook particular meals um, that he's really good at um, on Zoom. So he actually, uh, you know, uh, has people sign up and pay something to come and cook with him uh, and to experience, you know, the joy of sharing recipes and so on. I mean, he's doing this for profit, but you can imagine that it could be done very well, not for profit. And it doesn't have to be cooking. It could be a creation of community around painting, around music, around poetry, around literature, around yoga. Um, I'm trying to think of all the other things that you've brought up in your own um, uh, reflections. And so any of that is possible to explore, but you have to choose something and you have to think, what is it that will actually help me to increase my well being? So, uh, final thoughts. Um, as I said, the final project could be a research essay, for example, and this is all also going to be posted under course documents, this presentation uh, showing you examples of the final research um, possibilities. You can research the different pranayama styles, for example. Here are some sources on how to use 
uh, breath control, breath work in order to reduce anxiety or to promote uh, healthier lung capacity or to improve mood, you know? Um, I've mentioned before, I'm a huge fan of Vasily Kandinsky. Um, you can take a painter and you can research uh, their work and what was emotionally significant about their work. I've recreated, this is my picture of a recreation um, of, of the painting, a reproduction. And when I reproduced it, I started studying what Kandinsky was actually interested in exploring in his surrealist art. And I discovered that actually 57 of his works were confiscated by the Nazi regime in 1937. So they were purging his work because they thought it was degenerate art. And part of it has to do again with this free thinking. Nazis hated not only Jewish people, but people of color and gay people. And this was part of the cleansing, the genocide that they um, created based on a very kind of lack of emotion and pure logic, pure reason kind of mentality which we're still struggling to kind of purge out of our uh, education and life, I would argue. So you can take an artist and research their work, um, or you can create a yoga class, uh, record it and write a 500 word reflection on how it could help people to feel better, to exercise, to do something good for their body and mind. And after you guys, create your projects, then we'll, we're going to have the reflection component. But I'm going to stop there. It's enough uh, for today. The um, uh, class has already run for well over an hour. And I would like to just welcome some final questions if you have any personal questions. And um, we will uh, have our uh, one more full recorded lecture on what is expected on your research assignment next week.